So we're finishing up our series today, Garden Party. Man, I got to give a shout out, you know, to Matt Van Zant because we uh, we have a creative team meeting every month, and that's where we talk about well, you know, what messages are coming up and what we're going to be doing. You know, we know all the way to the end of the year where we're going to be going, and then we put in all these special elements and we do different things, and we're always looking for great ideas. So when you have ideas, share them with us if they're. There's a sermon series that you would like to see, or there's a topic you want us to be able to touch on. If you let us know those things, we love to be able to incorporate it. And so Matt was the one who said, you know, I think this idea of a summer garden party would be a great idea. And so it's been fun for me to be able to preach and to be able to just go into God's Word and see where did he use different metaphors and teaching, like taking an agreement culture, the one that Jesus was in, and he would use so many of the things that people understood every day in order to be able to illustrate, you know, heavenly truths. Many of the parables revolve around, you know, something in that area. And so it's been a lot of fun. And as we uh, take the opportunity today to be able to finish it up, I just want to thank you uh, for having been a part of it. And so I want to tell you this story that I read about. It said one day, there was a man and, and he was lost out in the desert and he had run out of water. And as he's kind of stumbling through the desert, he looks up and there's this old makeshift structure that's out there in the distance. And he knew he couldn't make it much longer. And so he got to the covering as fast as his worn out legs would be able to carry him. And to his surprise, when he went inside, this little makeshift, you know, shed, he found this jar of very pure looking water and it had a cap on it. And the jar was on the floor sitting next to a pump. And when he reached down to pick up the jar of water to begin to drink it, he noticed that there was a message that was beside it. And the message beside it said, use this water to prime the pump. And then it said, when you've gotten as much water as you need, then what you need to do is to refill the jar, put on the cap, and then leave it for the next person that's going to pass this way. And so the man suddenly found himself on those proverbial horns of a dilemma because he was so thirsty and so close to dehydration. He thought, I, I need to drink this. And what if I follow the directions on that sign and it doesn't end up working, that there's really no water that's in the well? And, and if I pour out all the water that I have right now to prime that pump and I get nothing in return, then I've taken this risk risk and I'm coming up with nothing. And so the man had to make a decision. It was either fill himself up now with the limited amount that he had, or was he willing to pour it out and to take the chance that deep down there, there, there was going to be more. And the man made the choice that he was going to prime the pump. And it was a good choice because the water flowed freely and he drank to his delight and then he collected enough water and he put it inside the jar and he put it, you know, uh, he tightened the top and he left and he was going to go on his journey. But then, then he had a second thought and he went back to the note where there was a pencil and he wrote down these words, trust me, it works. Just trust me, it works. And what he was trusting in was the fact that when you have effort, effort is what brings reward. And in the world that you and I live in today, that's sometimes a principle that a lot of people do not seem to embrace. Uh, they want an entitlement world where they should just receive and they don't have to put anything in, but they want to be able to get everything out. And so rather than being a contributor and making a difference in the world, there's a lot of people that just want to be consumers. But the Bible teaches the principle that if you are are a contributor, that there are going to be things that are going to come back to you. And we've been in a series where we've talked about sowing and reaping almost every week. And today's going to be the same. And I'm going to take you back 
to a passage of scripture that is very fundamental in my spiritual journey. And I've talked about this, I think either the first or second week that we were in the series, but I'm going to go back to some of it today and be able to share it with you. So if you have a Bible this morning, and those of you there at home watching online, we're thankful for you. And I hope that you'll look in your Bible or on your device to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse number six. Now, I love this passage for a lot of reasons, and one of the reasons is because I've been to Corinth, and if everything goes according to plan, I'll be back in Corinth sometime in late October, early November, on a trip that I'm doing on the footsteps of the Apostle Paul. Uh, also, you need to know that beginning on September the 8th, I'm going to begin a series called Journey, and we're going to be talking about the footsteps of Paul, and we're going to take a look at some of the highlights in his life and about what his spiritual journey was like. And on one of those spiritual journeys that we call a missionary journey, Paul had three of them in his ministry. He went to Corinth. And so I've actually stood in that place where the church at Corinth was located. And so Paul is sending this message to this church, and he's teaching them a principle, not only about generosity for themselves, but how to be generous with other people and how to break down some barriers that were getting established that was causing the work of Christ to not grow the way that it should or as fast as it should. So all of that this morning, beginning in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and this is the verse in my spiritual journey that made such an impact. Uh, for those of you that may have not heard uh, when I talked about this, my first job in a church was janitor and youth director. And uh, one day when I was being the janitor, I was buffing the floors, you know, one of those big machines, and I was dreaming about the day that I was going to be able to preach and that I was going to be preaching to a lot of people. And the people that I envisioned preaching to were teenagers because that's the crowd I wanted to reach. You know, I was in my early 20s, and so I felt like that this is the kind of work that God wanted me to be a part of. But I struggled with it because when I was thinking about, you know, preaching to these large gatherings of students, I was not in a church that had a large gathering of students. But yet, I, I had this idea in my mind. And so I got into the struggle about, is that being too ambitious? Uh, because I had a pastor that talked a lot about humanity Humility, and I certainly agree with that. I believe that God, you know, humbles those that are proud and he gives grace to those with humility. And so I was in that struggle about wanting to prosper in the area of preaching, not so much in the area of finance, but in the area of preaching. And I was having a struggle with that. And so I finished buffing the floor that day. I walked into my little office beside the janitor closet and I read this passage of scripture and in particular, verse number six, he says, now this I say to you, so Paul talking to the church at Corinth, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And I felt like I had found my answer because what I was sowing was the word of God as a preacher. And so as a young youth evangelist, I was getting to go to different places and there would be all of these teenagers that would be there and the crowds kept getting bigger and opportunities kept expanding. And I found myself, you know, sometimes being in a football stadium. I found myself being in arenas. I found myself in being in all these amazing places where I was getting to preach. And we were seeing not just 10 or 15 kids saved, but hundreds of kids saved at a time. And so that scripture is what God had given me to give me hope that I wasn't being ambitious. I was looking for the opportunity to sow more seed. And when I was able to do that, we were seeing immense amount of kids that were coming to Christ. When within the Southern Baptist Convention, it was probably the greatest years of harvest and baptisms and reaching young people 
people that the denomination had ever seen. And so getting to be a part of something like that was absolutely incredible. And so as you're sowing the seed, you're having the opportunity to be able to reap bountifully. Then Paul says, but you got to watch your motive. And each one must do as he's purposed in his heart. That's your motive. And so now he's talking about giving financially. And he says, you don't do it grudgingly and you don't do it under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. The word right there, cheerful, is actually in the Greek and Aramaic, the word hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. He loves people that get excited and they have joy about being able to give. Now, in the context of what was going on, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, and it's made up primarily of new Greek believers. And these new Greek believers, believers are uh, the Gentiles are hearing this message right and so he's preaching to a Gentile congregation and he's challenging them to take up an offering that they're going to send to Jerusalem for a Jewish church of new believers that are struggling financially to make ends meet. And you say, well, why, why were they struggling? Well, when a lot of these Jewish merchants became Christians, other Jews would no longer do business with them. The Orthodox would have nothing to do with them. And so this church in Jerusalem was struggling mightily financially. And so Paul is going to this church in Corinth and giving them a challenge. Well, the church in Corinth wasn't exactly rich. The church at Ephesus had a lot more financial firepower. But the church at Corinth, Paul is saying to them, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take up this offering and I want you to send it to these Jewish believers. So Paul is crossing across a racial barrier right here. And he's saying, these are our brothers. And you got to understand that some of those Jewish believers were saying, well, those Gentile believers, if they're going to really join into this thing, then they need to be be circumcised and they need to do everything that we're doing. And so a schism had arisen. They refer to these people as Judaizers. And so there was a lot of different things that were going on. And Paul is looking for a way to be able to bridge the tension, to be able to bridge the need. And he said, here's the way that you do it. You do it by being generous. You do it by being generous. And so that's what he says to the people here at Corinth. Each one of you, he's saying, you need to purpose in your heart how you're going to give. And I'll tell you this, you shouldn't do it grudgingly. You shouldn't do it under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And then he says, and here's your benefit. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you will always have sufficiency in everything and you may have an abundance for every good deed. Now, when you read that at first, you're going, well, is that saying to me that if I'm willing to give away that which I have, that somehow I'm just going to always have everything to meet every need that I have? No, that's not what he's saying. And I'm going to show you a passage where Paul illustrates that very well. But what he is saying is, is that we need to have this attitude attitude of giving and to the best of our ability we need to help other people because good things are going to come about because of it then he quotes psalms 112 he says as it is written quoting the older testament he scattered abroad and he gave to the poor and his righteousness endures forever then he goes back to the principle of the agrarian culture now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. And he says, now here's what I'm promising you. You will be enriched in everything with all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. So what he's saying to this church at Corinth is that when you give, you're impacting other people, not only with your financial gift, but you're lifting their spirit. You're lifting them up. 
That's why we go out and we do the things that we do in our community. We want to be able to lift our community up. And I shared with the congregation earlier this morning that uh, when we first started a church, and I say we because there were a group of us here, Marlon was a part of it, and uh, Donna was a part of it, Vitalis, and we had a group of us that started a, a church, and we started with a staff of seven, and I mean, we didn't have a thing. We didn't have a chair for an office. We, we didn't have anything, and literally our staff was meeting in Fayetteville, Georgia, in my basement when we first started the church, and we opened it on my American Experience express card. Don't leave home without it. I guarantee you it worked out really well for our church. But we're going out, and this is uh, in 1997, and trust me, whenever you go the second mile to do something, there are no traffic jams. Y'all trust me on that one right there. So we went to our schools and our community, and we said to them, we want to be able to serve you. Tell us what we can come in and what we can do to be able to serve you. And immediately they would go, well, well what is it that you really want from us? I, I can remember one principal said, are y'all wanting to use our gymnasium? I went, no, but we'll paint your gymnasium. And we did paint one, didn't we, Marta? We paid to have the gym painted. And, and people were like, no, there's got to be something, some reason that you're going to be offering to do things for us. And we were saying, no, we just want to be able to come and serve you. The hardest thing in the beginning was getting anyone to take us seriously. Then finally one day I get a call from a principal. Here's what I need. I need head lice kits. That was not what I thought our first call for a need would be need head lice kits. We've got kids that have head lice and their families can't afford the kits to be able to help them deal with it. So we bought all the head lice kits that they needed. Then I asked the principal, what's something else? He said, um, we have kids that need glasses. So I picked up my phone, I called my, my eye doctor, my optometrist that I love dearly. He's now with the Lord. His name is Dr. Walter Crickett. Uh, and I called Dr. Crickett and I said, Dr. Crickett, there's kids that need glasses. He said, don't, don't worry, we'll take it from here. He called all of his buddies that he went to school with at Emory. And all of a sudden, we were doing eyeglasses for kids. Then remember, Marlon, we got the call. We need to teach English as a second language. And in our little mission church that very first day when I made that statement, and said we need people to teach English as a second language. We had 90 people sign up that morning. 90 people to say, I'll take my time and I will teach English as a second language. And from there, it just continued to grow. From there, it just continued to multiply in the way that we were going out in the way that we were sowing seed. And because we were sowing the seed the way that we were doing it, things were growing exponentially. And that's the way that God's economy works. Now, it took us two years of sowing seed before we ever really started seeing a harvest. It took us two years of going out and saying, we want to be there and we want to make this impact. And so God did just miraculous things. Well, this passage that we're looking at has so much of that idea that's embedded with it. He says in verse number 11, he says, now you're going to be enriched in everything with all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. So he's saying, while we're doing what we're doing is not for praise to come to us, but it's the praise is to go to God for what he's doing. So that's why our mission statement says we exist to show God's love. That means by going out and doing the different things that we do, we exist to show God's love in such a way that people would exchange just ordinary living for an extraordinary life through the transforming power of Jesus Christ. And that's why we do what we do. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints. So you know what? Some people say to me, well, Ike, if you're so focused on out there, what about in here? You can't ever outgive God. 
We can't outgive God. You take a look at what's happened on this campus in the last, you know, years, and you see the way that we came back from the brink of even having to shut the doors of this church, and you see where the church is now, and you see financially the way that we've been blessed, the things that we've been able to do to this campus, the way that we've, we've kept up these facilities. And, and you know, that's, that's not an easy thing to do. And I can remember uh, Rick Cothran, when I first came to this church, he and Joyce, and I was talking to him and Rick said, I make sure that you put in funding for capital improvements. It's not just enough that we're being blessed with what we do, we got to keep up what we've been blessed with. And we've tried to do that. But at one point, I think Roger is somewhere in the room over here. Roger, we spent close to about $800,000 to a million dollars just on air conditioning repairs and replacing air conditioners, if you can imagine that. Now, if I'd have been creative, we wouldn't have fixed the air conditioners. We had turned up the heat, and I could have preached on hell and maybe motivated some people to give a, a little bit more. You know, you start sweating, it, it'll really make a difference to you. But, you know, we, we, were, we were meeting our needs here, but we wanted to be able to give out there. But it is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, he's saying, hey, church at Corinth, they're going to glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel in Jesus Christ. That's what we want people to say about this church. We want people, when they think about this church, to think about how big our God is, not about how big we want to be able to get a as a church. And he says, and all of this is going to happen, and the liberality of your contribution to them and to all, while they also, by prayer, on your behalf yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. And thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Now, you know what the indescribable gift is? That's Jesus Christ. And he's saying, hey, they may be different from us. We may be a little bit different from them, but there's one thing we can agree on. We've got this indescribable gift in Jesus Christ. So, the Apostle Paul is challenging, and he's saying to the church at Corinth, look, here's our opportunity to be able to impact those needy Jewish churches in Judea. And he's saying, I, when I come and I've got my people with me, I don't want us to be embarrassed. I want us to be able to go out and to be able to make this huge impact. And what Paul is teaching is what is called the law of reciprocity. And the law of reciprocity is whatever you put in something is what you're going to get back out. I mean, that's the law of the sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. With the measure you give, it will be measured back to you. In some form or another, it's going to come back. Just a biblical principle that you see repeated over and over again throughout the scripture. You can go over to Proverbs uh, chapter 11. Let me do that right quick. In Proverbs chapter 11, in verses number 24 and 25, it says, there's one who scatters, and yet he increases all the more. In other words, there's somebody who's given away, and yet as he gives away, he seems to increase all the more. And there's another who withholds what's justly due, and yet it only results in want. Listen to the way he phrases this. The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. It's the principle of priming the pump. And when we prime that pump and we do the right things, God has this amazing way of being able to bring things back to us. And, and so what Paul was saying to the church at Corinth is, we need to do this, and I want to do this, but I don't want you to feel like I'm trying to wring the offering out of you. I don't want you to feel like I'm trying to browbeat you into doing it because if we do it for that reason, 
then we're going to lose out on the blessing that God wants to give us. And that's why Paul goes to this example of the farmer and saying, you know, here's what the law of reciprocity really looks like. Now, it's used in other ways, too, in Scripture. In uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, Jesus said, Judge not that you would be not judged. For with the judgment that you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it's going to be measured right back against you. That's the law of reciprocity. And the idea of these passages is that whatever you do with your life, be it good or be it bad, it's going to come back to you. It will end up coming back to you. And at this moment, I want to say what I saw for the opening ceremonies of the Olympics in France was absolutely disgusting. And the opportunity that I've taken to look at what was portrayed, the mockery of, of the Last Supper, the way that it was done, it's going to come back on them. And you know, Christianity, there's a lot of people go, oh, Christianity is not under attack. It's not this and it's not that. Then you're completely ignorant of what is taking place in this world. When it comes to Christianity, when it comes to persecution, and here's where the eyes of the world is looking to a country, and what they do is they make a mockery out of Christianity. I guarantee you they wouldn't have had the, the Koran pull it up there and be making fun of it and ripping it to shreds, but you can do that to Christianity. So folks, whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. And I guarantee you that there's going to be some sowing and reaping there. And I've stood in that country before, and I stood in a cemetery at Normandy, and I looked at all these white crosses that represented all of these soldiers from America that came there and gave their lives in order to be able to uh, stop the Hitler and Nazis and all of that from taking place in that country and in others. And the investment of life that was given there is astounding. And so for me, last night, it's not a political commentary, it's just a common sense for me that when I see God's word being mocked, when I see the last night of my Savior being a parody for someone to try, just to trot out a bunch of trash on stage, it is a shame. So that's just my thoughts for this morning, all right? Well, that was not in my notes. I just want you to know that. So just kind of hit my brain right there, all right? So we trust God's work that when we faithfully and cheerfully give that our efforts are going to be multiplied. And so this idea of God's harvest makes us ask this question. Well, what is God's harvest? I mean, you come here to Piedmont Church you give your hard-earned money uh, to, to what we do. You, you invest in heart for the house, and you do this. And I told you, you know, th this is sowing. We're sowing these dollars into these facilities, all this. Well, what is the harvest for a church? Well, the harvest are souls. That, that's, what, that's what the harvest is. Uh, I had a friend named Ernest Key, and uh, Marlon remembers this well. And Ernest Key helped us to start North Star. Uh, a man named Ernest Key and a man named Wade Pierce were two integral players in everything that we did. They joined with me from the beginning, and they said, we're going to put our financial resources behind you in what you're trying to accomplish here. And um, Ernest Key would always make this statement. He'd say, what is the price of a soul? What is the price of a soul? And, and you think, for some of you that gave money over here, uh, maybe right now you, you don't even have kids, but maybe one day you, you'll have a kid. Or maybe right now you've got a grandchild. Maybe the grandchild's real young, but they'll end up going to this building over here, and they'll end up hearing about Jesus, 
and they'll end up singing those songs about Jesus. And they'll end up in our, not just our preschool ministry, but then they'll be in our children's ministry. And somewhere during that children's ministry, they're going to end up coming to Jesus. And I guarantee you, everything that you gave for that building will seem so insignificant to knowing that your grandchild has embraced Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Because, folks, we always stand one generation from atheism. One generation. That's why we invest. That's why with Jake and what he does with those middle schoolers and Isaac, what he's doing with those high schoolers and those college students and what Savannah does with the preschool and Jennifer does, you, you know, with the children. That's why we invest and we're doing what we're doing. You, you can't put a price. And so the harvest here is the result of the ministry of the church. We give so that there'll be a harvest of souls that can be gathered at harvest time. We give to the church church, just like Corinth was giving to another church so that the gospel can go forth and, and people can be saved. That, that's why Heart for the House, and maybe if you weren't here and we talked about Heart for the House, we have these little brochures out there in the lobby that you can pick up. And our goal was to raise $700,000. Now I can tell you that so far over $250,000 has already been given, and I can tell you there's another $250,000, roughly right, Roger, that has been pledged. And and we're aiming, you know, for next May uh, to be able to finish up, you know, fully uh, funding this 700000 That's our goal. That's what we hope to be able to do. And so at Christmas, you won't hear me mention this really again, other than just cursory as we move along, you know, uh, in our worship services. But we're going to come back at Christmas, and that's going to be the main thrust of what we're going to be doing for Christmas is to help, you know, uh, bridge that gap of that other $200,000. How, how can we get there? Now, we'll still be giving our missions money. And, um, you know, I saw Ralph Bell in our earlier service with Sheltering Grace what they do with unwed mothers. Uh, we give money, you know, to a crisis pregnancy center. Uh, we give money to a, a must ministries to help people in poverty. And we give money, we take money toward missions, and it helps to fund some of what our team does, like going down to Brazil. And they just went down to Brazil, and Ed, I can see you over here. Was it 115 people who made professions of Christ? 115 people accepted Jesus Christ with that team that was down in Brazil. And hey, that's good soil that we're, we're putting it into. Now, are those people ever going to be here and be in our church? No, but does that really matter? Because if you're about the kingdom and not just about a church, it's like when churches try to compete with each other. Rather than trying to be the best church in your community, why not be the best church for your community? By knowing what your community's needs are and going there and investing and doing what we're doing. That's what we're trying to do in the life of this church. And that's why Heart for the House is so important. And I can't thank you all enough for your giving and the impact that you've made there. So. You know, uh, Paul goes on and he says, so the whole reason that you're doing this is because then what you're going to do is you're going to show people how much you care and then they're going to glorify God because you've helped to meet that need. Now, Paul in uh, James, uh, excuse me, in James chapter 2 verse 26, it says faith without works is dead. That, uh, you know, that, that faith without works is dead. In other words, we don't do what we do so that we can be saved. We do what we do because we are saved. And we want to make a difference and we want to make a change. So these two groups that we're talking about, they, they were so different. And it was in the early days of the church. But it was the gospel of Jesus Christ, the indescribable gift, and generosity that brought them together. And so they ended up producing good fruit. In Matthew 7, Jesus said, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you're going to know them by their fruits. So, Paul's reasoning. If this Gentile church in Corinth wanted to show the Jewish church that their faith 
was just as genuine as theirs without having to go through the rite of circumcision, then the collection would show exactly that. It would be a real life depiction of the parable that Jesus shared about the good Samaritan. And their fruit of their faith was a love offering that they took up for this church. And so Paul says the generosity of your contribution for them. So, you know, let's say that you've got a disagreement with someone else that's a Christian. And maybe you're going through some things right now with each other. This is a great story on if you have a disagreement with another believer, then love them, be generous to them, shower them with grace. Because when the church gets at each other's throat, the world just loves it. The world wants to see the church fail because we're seen as hateful. We're seen as hypocritical. We're seen as bigoted. And we overcome these views when the world sees God's grace working its way through us in the way that we impact our community and we make a difference. Now, Elon Musk came out with a statement yesterday about with what's going on in the world that he was afraid that Christianity would perish. Well, let me put Mr. Musk's concerns to rest. The gospel is not going to perish. Christianity is not going to perish. How do you know that, Ike? Because the Bible says that God's word never fails. God's word never fails. And that God's word is never going to perish. It's just, it's not going to happen. Uh, do I believe that Christianity is under attack? Yes, I do. Do I sometimes believe when I look at the world that I'm living in right now that we could be in the last days? There, there's no doubt about it. You watch what's happening in Israel right now. If you were up in the Golan Heights, which I've been, there were 12 kids and teenagers that were killed yesterday in a rocket attack. That's going to be your next area that you're going to see some major conflicts in. I've been in that same Druze village. And for those of you who went with me to Caesarea Philippi, that's where we ate lunch one day was in that community where that took place. You're going to see heightened tensions that are going to be coming there. And so rather than Christians fighting amongst each other and trying to judge what each other is doing, what we need to be doing is unifying ourselves together in prayer and with a common concern to help win as many people to Jesus Christ as we possibly can in these days. That's what we need to be doing. That's what we need to be a part of. So I'm going to go to a video and they're going to take this stuff off the stage of my mentor, Zig Ziglar. I started with the story about the pump. And Zig became famous uh, by taking a pump and doing an illustration of the way that it works. And so um, they're not coming to get my stand, so I'll probably carry it off for them. But I want you to turn your attention up here. Here we go. I want you to turn your attention to the screens because this is a great illustration of the way that life works. Whatever you put in is what you're going to get out. Guys? I got a couple of good friends who many, many years ago were riding around in the South Alabama foothills. It was a hot August day, and uh, they got thirsty. Bernard Haygood was driving. Jimmy Glenn was the passenger. They pulled behind this old abandoned farmhouse. And uh, Bernard hopped out. He ran over, and there was an old uh, pump on the well. And he grabbed the handle, and he started the pump. How many of you have ever used one of these old-fashioned water pumps? Can I see your hand, please? Okay, well, he had just a pump in the way, you know it. After about three or four minutes, he said, Jimmy... Better get that old bucket over there and dip some water out of the creek. We're going to have to prime the pump. How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say you got to prime the pump? Well, for you underprivileged non-pumpers, that just means you got to put something in here before you get something out there. Can't you just see an old farmer 
standing out in the fields in October and saying, Lord, I know I didn't plant a thing this year, but if you give me a big crop this year, I'll plant more than anybody next year. It ain't that way, folks. You got to put something in before you can expect to get anything out. Well, he's just a pumping away. You know, that's hot. It's August. I mean, uh, the question is just how much pumping are you going to do for a drink of water? And finally, old Bernard said, you know, Jimmy, I don't believe it's any water down there. Jimmy said, yeah, it is, Bernard. You know, in South Alabama, the wells are deep. And, oh, we're glad they're deep because the deeper the well, the cooler, the cleaner, the sweeter, the purer, the better tasting the water. And isn't that true of life? Isn't it true that anything worth doing is worth doing poorly? Until you can learn to do it well. We'll never know how much more success we would have had had we just had a little more pumping in there and pump and pump and pump and pump. Well, finally, old Bernard just got disgusted. He threw up his hand. He said, Jimmy, there's just no water down there. Jimmy said, don't stop, Bernard. Don't stop. If you stop, the water's going to go all the way back down, and then you're going to have to start all over. The reality is, folks, and I'm totally convinced of this, this is the story of America. This is your story. This is the story of success. This is the story of life. I believe with all of my heart that if you will pump long enough and hard enough and enthusiastically enough, that eventually the reward is going to follow the effort. And then once that water starts to flow, all you got to do is just keep a little easy, steady pressure on it, and you're going to get more water than you can possibly use. If you drink of this water, you're not ever going to thirst again. How much pumping are you doing in your spiritual life right now? How much Bible study are you doing? How faithful are you to your prayers? How faithful are you to church attendance? See, that's the way that we pump spiritually in life. And we get out what we're putting in. And I think it's just a beautiful illustration to be able to end our series on garden party. I want your life to be a beautiful garden. I want you to be able to experience the harvest, to see your children come to Christ to see your grandkids come to Christ, to see your neighbors that you invite come to Jesus, or your coworkers when they come here for something, to see them come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. See, the way you measure the effectiveness of a church is through how many lives have been changed. And the greatest change of all is that when you exchange your sin for God's righteousness, that's what we call the great exchange here at Piedmont. And then when people get baptized, we talk about the great exchange and you'll see them wear a t-shirt because now they, they go from just knowing about God to having trusted God. And now they publicly display their faith, not by wearing a t-shirt, but by following the Lord and believers baptism. We're going to be talking a lot to you about that in this upcoming series called Playbook. And we're going to be talking about on a day that we've set aside in September, we're going to be doing a baptism at the lake that came from an idea from one of our elders, Chad Moore. Why can't we go and do something like that? So September the 8th, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be giving you all that information. On September the 1st, we're going to be uh, online only. And I'm going to be teaching the membership class because there's some of you in here today, you haven't yet joined this church, but you're saying, you know what? I need to do that because you never know when you're going to need the church. This morning, it was illustrated to me as I was getting ready to leave. A gentleman came walking down the aisle and he waited so politely till I'd spoken to everyone else. And he said, um, Ike, I need your help. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, my wife died this week. And he said, I need to have a funeral. What do I do? And I called Marlon over. Marlon met with him. Marlon, they've been married for 68 years. 68 years. And he needs his church. And we're going to be there for him. 
we're going to be there for them. That's, that's what we do. We stop what we're doing and we go, this is time to be the shepherds. This is the time to make a difference. I want you to pray for our schools today. We've talked about that. I want you to pray for our building program. We've talked about that. We got to close that gap on the rest of those dollars because we just love to be able to finish it with no long-term debt. That's what our goal is. And we're so blessed, y'all. These beautiful facilities and everything else, we're so blessed. So I'm just going to ask you to stand to your feet. If you want Jesus today, I'll, I'm going to meet you right down here. Marlon's going to meet you right over here. You just come down and talk to us and we'll tell you exactly how to do that. We'll pray with you. And I hope some of you will come down and just pray for our educators. Would you pray for the safety of our schools? Pray that those classrooms are protected by angels. Just pray for our students as well. In the name of Jesus, I invite you to come today.